This is a Cayman 27 special report, a matter of the heart. Sponsored by Cayman Airways and the Reef Resort. Romantics say all love comes from the heart. Doctors say all human life centers around the heart. The average human heart beats around 100,000 times a day, pumping blood throughout our bodies. But what happens when it's not designed the way it should be? In this Cayman 27 special report, Matters of the Heart, we'll take a look at a hidden risk that can be deadly if undiagnosed. And many of the victims are young. Thank you for joining us. I'm April Cummings. And with me right now is Kevin Wattler. He's, of course, a popular face here at Cayman 27. We've asked Kevin to share his personal experience with you, an experience that we believe can really help save lives. Yeah, thanks, April. But uh, I have a disease called hypotrophic cardiomyopathy, and it's also known as HCM. It's a genetic cardiac disease marked by the thick thickening of the heart muscles. Now, the doctors told me that if I was an uh, athlete while I was growing up, there's a good chance that I probably would not be here today. I'd probably be dead because of the thickness of my heart. So this is the leading cause of sudden death in young athletes. Like you said, fortunately you weren't an athlete, although we wouldn't have known that from looking at you. Um, but you found this out very late in life, and fortunately you really listened to your body. Yes. Yeah, I was experiencing some, some chest tightness and um, for about a, a year, and I just didn't think much of it. I, I'm not a person that goes to the gym. I'm not a person that is very, very active. That's just not me. Um, but I decided to go ahead and get it checked out, and guess what? This is what I have. And that's why we're here tonight. That's one of the things we're going to be talking about throughout the show, talking about not only Kevin's experience, but actually what it's taught all of us and what you can learn from it. So we're going to take a quick break. Um, we really do want to thank you, Kevin, for sharing your experience with us. We know sometimes it can be difficult to talk about such personal and close matters, but we're grateful that you've decided to do that and also some of the excellent guests that we have. So throughout the show tonight, we're going to talk about the importance of screening our young people. We're also going to find out what it's like to live with the disease, and we'll also be talking to the mother of a young man who died while playing the sport that he loved. That's all still ahead. Welcome back. Let's find out more now about this condition highlighted by our own Kevin Wattler. Joining us are Lisa Salberg, the founder of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, and Dr. Suk Yin of the Cayman Heart Fund. Thank you both for joining us. Dr. Well, thank you for having us. Dr. Yin, let's start with you first. Yeah. Tell me, what is HCM? Okay, I think before we even go to HCM, which is the difficult word we are all trying to pronounce, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How could you tell? Um, let's start off with the heart. The mm -hmm. heart is basically a pump. But how to make the pump work, it needs muscles to actually squeeze the heart in order to deliver the blood to the rest of the body. But it also, there is also an electrical component to it. So it needs both to function properly. Now in, in HCM, what happens is that it is a, a genetic disorder, it's familiar, which means that it can happen in families. And therefore, it's important that you know, if you've got family history of HCM, you need to be screened. But what is HCM? It's basically a thickening of the heart muscles. So when the heart is very thickened, it also demands more oxygen more blood into the heart in order for it to function. So therefore, you, you, work, you can get you know, sudden cardiac death when somebody is like pumping the heart too hard. The muscles you know, needs more blood, and when there's not enough oxygen and blood to it, it will suddenly stop at a rest. So Hokum is basically, or HCM, basically is uh, one of those diseases where your muscle is thickened and therefore you know, it, it uh, sort of uh, compromises the function of the heart. So literally, it's tough heart. Tough heart, yeah, exactly. Not tough love, but tough heart. <laughs> the muscle is, is three times or four times bigger than you know, somebody of the same age, same sex and same, same size. So Lisa, uh, you've flown down to talk to us about this, um, something near and dear to you, obviously. Let's talk a little bit about you, why you're here, and in the process, let's talk <coughs> something about the, the symptoms of HCM and, and who can develop it. Between the two of you, we'll just sort of have a free-flowing conversation. Yeah. Perfect. So thank you for having me. It's nice to be in the Caymans from New Jersey. Um, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic heart disease. It affects many people, one in 500 people actually, in the entire world. So there's lots of people here in the Caymans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, most are undiagnosed. So I founded the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association back in 1996 after my family had suffered the third sudden cardiac arrest and fourth death in our family. So it strikes 
very close to home, and you'll be meeting my daughter later. I'll tell her story. But HCM is very common, and we have to do more to educate people how to find it within themselves and to understand what risk factors and what symptoms they should be reporting to their physician so that they can get appropriate care. Yeah, I, th I think the myth is, right, Lisa, a lot of people just think HCM as the cause of sudden cardiac death, right? right. And therefore, it's, you know, people who have got HCM presents as sudden cardiac death, which is one of them. But we were discussing before the show that is not the case. People who are in their 50s and their mm. 60s can have HCM as well. So you can present at any age from birth to 90. Most people with HCM will present during puberty. So between 12 and 20, you'll normally get diagnosed. Diagnosis doesn't mean death. I was diagnosed when I was 12, and I'm still here. So I'm hoping to stay here for a long time yet. People with HCM can live long, normal, productive lives, but they do need care, therapy, management. Some need surgery and some need more invasive treatments like an implantable defibrillators and some need heart transplants. So just a moment ago, we, we showed the, the models on the table with, mm -hmm. the, with the two hearts. Um, and, and it struck me how little attention we give to matters of the heart in general until something dramatic such as this happens. I mean, are there, are there symptoms that um, we should be yeah. looking for? Yeah, I mean, you look at the model on that side now on TV, so it's a bit difficult. You know, on, the, on, the, on my left, on the left hand side I think, of, the, of the TV side, you see the muscles of the heart on that side, it's, it's the normal heart, which mm -hmm. is much thinner. And you see the one that is really thickened. You see how thick the heart is, and dense therefore, it is, exactly. Yes. But what is more important is that you see the thickness of the muscle of the heart has caused the cavity, which is the place where the blood goes in. So it limits decreased. the ability yeah, the, 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 for that to flow. Yeah, the, the, exactly. But more importantly, you have got a, a smaller chamber for mm -hmm. the blood to be in, right? And that's one important thing. So when you say what are the symptoms, shortness of breath is one of the symptoms. So therefore, let, let's say Kevin was a bit more athletic when he was young, he would be exerting himself, you know, running in a marathon, for example. He's, his heart would dep depend, needs more oxygen, number one, and he's pumping his heart really hard. All right, so suddenly there's a huge demand. So he's going to have more shortness of breath. And of course, we say, maybe that's normal when you're right, running. Because marathon, if I'm an athlete or I'm running, I expect to have a degree of shortness of breath. I might not, especially if I'm young, not even mm -hmm. recognize that as a potential and issue. And you mentioned between 12 to 20. We, we hear our children say, oh, I'm a bit short of breath, I've got a bit of chest discomfort. You know, all those are signs and symptoms of fatigue, dizziness, mm. so very common symptoms there. So who has got it and who hasn't got it? So I think Lisa will... The other symptoms you want get, get to look at are palpitations, awareness of your heart beating, getting dizzy when you stand up, getting dizzy after exercise. Those are other common symptoms. The other thing we look for is people who've been told that they have an innocent murmur. Mm. I am not suggesting that all innocent murmurs are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if there is a murmur present, especially if it's transient, it comes and it goes, these are things you want to get investigated by a cardiologist. And especially if you have a family history of heart disease under 50, and specifically of cardiac arrest, you definitely want to report that to your doctor because these are the people who need more invasive testing to identify if their hearts are in fact normal or not. All right, ladies, thank you very much. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about why it is so critical that we screen young athletes. Um, also, a mother who's lost her son to HCM on the field of play, she has an important message for all of us that's all still ahead. Later in the program, we'll also talk to two young adults who are living with HCM. We'll be right back. Dr. Marcus Hasday is a cardiologist in Orlando, one of the few doctors in Florida listed as an HCM specialist. He says screening is essential. So the people that are diagnosed after they have symptoms or an event, when in reality you would really like to change that pie, and most of the people be diagnosed before they even have symptoms. So that, I think that's the importance of screening everybody. Um, pediatricians should be start at, at some degree uh, to start looking who has a murmur, who has an abnormal EKG, and uh, that's my opinion. I mean, might I tell you what, even before I became in a, so involved in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you don't know how many times my wife came with a form from make my three girls play competitive tennis at state level. She wanted a physical dog. I said, you know what, all three of you are coming to my office for a physical, and all three of you are having EKGs. <laughs> I was very, very strong about that, because they, they wanted an easy way out to get the paperwork signed for sport participation because that is a doctor. You know, we went and we went the full, full, 
full evaluation. Everybody should be screened. All, all the, all the, you can, you just cannot say like in Europe they do. Well, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're going to screen soccer players only. Mind that in the United States we say, well, we're only gonna screen baseball players. What happened to the volleyball team? What happened to the swimmers? What, you, know, you had to screen everybody. Everybody in high school or, or even before, you know, like in, in ninth grade would be a good time to start screening. For, you know, cause remember, some people may have the disease and may not manifest the phenotype. The phenotype means the genetic expression doesn't necessarily show up until they are uh, teenagers or young adults. And young athletes with unknown heart issues are at high risk of sudden death. We know it's taken the life of at least one young Caymanian recently. Jerome Graham to collapsed and died in 2012 on the pitch during a training session. And frankly, it was an eye opener for many of us. Cayman 27's Kevin Morales shows us what officials say they're doing to try to stop this from happening again. Meet Kareem James. His brother Jerome Graham was a talented footballer who died nine months ago during practice. The cause? An enlarged heart. From time it was like in Pampas coming up, it was like me and him, me and him. So it's all lonely now, you know. When you think about it, when I sit down and reminisce, really miss him. James was one of 63 athletes invited to get checks on their heart health. After government partnered with a U.S. hospital and doctors like Anthony Migalski. Sometimes the first symptom that an athlete has from one of these conditions is sudden death. So this identifies the athlete before that catastrophe happens. And that's just what happened. After looking at the heart's electrical activity and structure, doctors found abnormalities in six athletes. He was just a special, special boy. Martha Robinson is Graham's grandmother. Part of her feels this type of clinic should have started years ago. Yes, I'm sorry that he didn't, because perhaps he would be alive, no. But I'm still glad that he started to do it still. He'll be able to save some other young boys. All right. But you know what I mean? Everything happened for a reason. Maybe somebody else could have that same problem like my brother. And, and you know what I mean? It, this could save him. Which is why this was organized in the first place. Like I said, after Bird passed away, and you know, having known him from, from time he was five or six years old as a young boy playing football and to lose him tragically like that. But as you said, we hope that in his memory again, you know, we can save the lives of others. Then Health Minister Mark Scotland and Sports Director Colin Anglin told us that it wasn't possible to make it mandatory for all athletes to be screened. The screenings were offered to 63 high-performance athletes. Six of them returned abnormal results. Susan Blagrow, the mother of Jerome and Cream, joins us now. And I'm so grateful to you for coming. I imagine this can't be easy for you. No, it's not. Mm. Why was it worth coming to talk about? Um, um, in the future, other people can be aware of the symptoms and know. To, uh, making athletes go out and have their heart checked, you know. Would you have ever thought that this was necessary? I mean, you have athletic children, many of us do. This isn't something that we would have thought of. No. But now things have changed. Things have changed, yes. Sir. How has the response been um, from the community around you? What have you What have you received from them? They have been supporting, a lot of phone calls, and you know, a lot of encouragement. Was there a history in your family that that, in retrospect, now would have led to some knowledge or awareness about this if we'd all known more? Well, not that I know of. Um, maybe his father's side of family. I was told, yeah. And it's funny too, one of the things we often don't think of is to really ask more questions about the family history. Um, Dr. Yin and Lisa are still with us right now. And, and this is one of those things that I realize we often don't do. We don't think and to ask all of those and questions. And we don't listen to our children as well sometimes. You say, you're all right, type thing. Did, um, if you don't mind me asking, did Jerome actually complain to you about any chest pains or shortness of breath ever in any of his you know, activities? No complaint at all. That's why I say this, this presentation, mm -hmm. sudden death in this, in this case. So. Well, we've never actually asked him. Mm -hmm. We know from children who have survived cardiac arrest that afterwards we ask them, did you ever feel anything? And a lot of them do tell us, well, yeah, but I thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. And we have to help our children understand what a normal feeling is mm -hmm. and when we need to communicate that to our parents and our physicians. If you had advice for other parents, um, what would it be today? Um, have your children checked, you know, as often as possible, you know. 
and listen to them. And listen to them. Ladies, we, we've asked all of you together really to, to really create a sense of awareness about yeah. all of this. I mean, it is, it is emotional for you and, and for viewers as well because many people in this community knew this young man in particular. But it's been a year and we wonder about whether enough change is happening in terms of what we actually do. Yeah, because Lisa and I were discussing, we're not just talking about just screening athletes. You know, this is a, the condition that can happen to any child between, like they say, presenting between 12 to 20. So realistically, we should be getting to schools and screening. You know, we do screening at school for their height and their weight and, you know, before they go into school, vaccinations are given. Maybe, you know, we're talking about massive screening. We should be part of the, uh, the exercise that we actually should introduce a, a screening, cardiac screening, in terms of school children, not so just athletes alone. Thinking of cardiac screening, it doesn't necessarily have to be a test. We need to go through questions and answers, talking to people about family history and signs and symptoms. And when those signs and symptoms and family histories exist, then we move on to full screening with EKGs, echocardiograms, and cardiologists getting involved in the care of the child. Mm -hmm. So the screening part of realistically may not cost us anything other than filling a form. It's funny, that was actually what I was, was just about to Paper. say. Um, we yeah, do have to take a quick break, but I guess that was the question I was going to leave with you. Regardless of the cost, in this case even free, is it worth finding out? Oh yes, it is. Unquestionably. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for talking Thank with us. We me. are going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, there are two young people who found out they had HCM before it was too late. We're going to hear from them and talk about the impact the diagnosis has had on their lives. Their stories are coming up. A Matter of the Heart, sponsored by Cayman Airways. Fly Cayman Airways and check in two bags free and enjoy complimentary Tortuga Rum Punch in flight. Come see why those who fly us love us. And the Reef Resort, home of the ultimate island vacation. The Reef is Grand Cayman's only full-service all-beachfront resort. Located in the tranquil and picturesque East End, you will enjoy a truly serene tropical escape. Thank you for staying with us for this Cayman 27 News special, Matters of the Heart, as we find out more about HCM. Joining me again is our own Kevin Wattler. And earlier in the program, we introduced you to Lisa Salberg. Her daughter, Rebecca, joins us now. Uh, she, too, is an HCM patient. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Part of the, the reason that we wanted to talk to you, not just Kevin, because we know him well, but um, you as well as to give people a sense of what it is like to live with HCM. Talk to me a little bit about what your experience has been like. Well, being a young adult with HCM, I basically live my life like most young adults would. I go out with my friends, I like to go to the gym, but of course with HCM, I know my limitations and I keep in them. And life is good that way. So you are likely more aware of what the symptoms might be, more in touch with your body, things that maybe somebody else might write off as perfectly, this is perfectly normal to not be able to breathe and gasp. Yeah. You know that that's not the case for you. Yeah, luckily because of my mother being Lisa Salberg, she kind of helped me there. Kevin, what about you? I mean, for you, we, um, we worked with Kevin for several years. We've known him since he was a freshman, really in college. He'd been interning at the station. He works with us full time with, as a web producer, weather person, breaking news, excitement, <laughs> fast paced. This is the fabric of Kevin Watler's life. So for us, it was a surprise that something like this could actually be going on the whole time and none of us knew. You know, April, it's funny you say that. Growing up, doctors, every physical I took, the doctors always told me, Boy, you, you're one of the most healthiest people I know. I get sick once a year, usually around Christmas time. <laughs> and I didn't think anything could really be wrong with me. Um, I did experience a bit of chest tightness for the past year or so. But like I said earlier, it's just that I thought that it's just something that's normal. It's me being unhealthy. I don't really exercise. I probably yeah. should. I'm out of shape. Exactly. I'm out of shape. And um, come to find out, I have HCM. So what were the symptoms like? You mentioned um, the, the palpitations in your case, I think, were the thing that really sent Kevin from, I don't feel quite right to let me go get this checked out. Right. Yeah, I would be laying down in bed, 12 o'clock at night, so I'm in a resting mode. No breaking news is going on. <laughs> and um, I'm just watching television or on my laptop, and my heart just started to race. And I'm like, why? 
I'm not nervous. What's going on? I talked to a couple of people about it. They said, oh, it may be stress. You, you overwork yourself because you're always checking your phones. You're always working. So I just voted off. Uh, uh, it's just stress related or something. And I didn't pay it too much attention. And in the end, one day you did. Both of you must have at some point or another had some moment that said, I'm taking this seriously. What was yours? Well, when I was younger, growing up with my mom in the whole HCMA, I started feeling my heart more, and I was more aware of my heart. And finally, it was time and got diagnosed, and I got an ICD implanted. So now I'm safe and everything. So once I had the ICD implanted, I became much more calm about the whole situation because I was safe. Kevin, what about you? What was that thing that, that drove you to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this looked at? What scared you truly the most? Well, really and truly, I, I usually don't get to work until a, late, a little later than most because I work later than most. And I, I felt that palpitation started to happen. I, I just woke up. It was before I went to work, I said, let me go ahead and check this out at the hospital. Well, not necessarily a hospital, but I went to a, a clinic. And a doctor did an EKG on me. And he says, you may be having a heart attack right now. This is abnormal. In fact, you're not leaving. You need to call your family, tell them to meet you at the hospital. And you, you're going to be admitted. I'm admitting you. And I'm like... And, and we should point out, Kevin never calls in sick. He rarely takes vacation. Even when he goes on vacation, he tries to work. You're the guy that would never stop working to take care of a personal matter. So when you called us, we knew something was up, even though you tried to tell us it was perfectly fine. <laughs> well, I felt fine, uh, other than the little palpitations that was going on. And of course, the ambulance came to pick me up, took me to the hospital. They admitted me and put me in a critical care unit until uh, to monitor me uh, until they... they eventually diagnosed me when I went overseas to tell me I had HCM. So what did you do about it after that? Well, I did get an ICD um, based on Lisa's recommendation. I found her um, website and um, everywhere I looked about HCM, her name was linked to it. <laughs> so I, I contacted Lisa and uh, she advised me what I needed to do. I went to two different cardiologists and um, in fact, one of them worked with a team of six and they all kept on saying the same thing over and over. And I said, you know what, I got to listen to this lady, I got to listen to these doctors. Uh, I, it's not my area of specialty, it's not breaking news, and I should probably <laughs> pay attention. He should actually listen. So, I mean, how do you feel today? Today, I feel fine. And uh, having this ICD in me makes me, just like um, Rebecca said, makes me feel a lot safer. Yeah, so you're more comfortable. We're going to talk a little bit more of that in just a couple of moments. Um, when we come back, we're going to take a closer look at some of the treatment options. And of course, because we couldn't resist, we're going to share a personal moment with our own Kevin Wattler in the moments following his surgery. On this Cayman 27 News special, we are exploring matters of the heart, in particular those living with a condition known as HCM. Although it can be fatal, there are steps you can take to prevent sudden death. There is one thing that Lisa, Rebecca, and Kevin all decided to do. They got an ICD. Of course, I'm no medical expert, so I'm going to leave Lisa, who is definitely an expert in these matters, to explain this to us. Just quickly show us, and Kevin has um, one as well. This is an ICD. This is an ICD, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So you've all seen defibrillators on TV where they put the paddles on you in shock. We have this device implanted in our chest here with wires that go into our heart. And this little device has a computer and a battery. It reads every rhythm of the heart. And if we have a rhythm that is dangerous, so a tachycardia or a fibrillation, the heart's going too fast or it loses the ability to contract properly, it sends a life-saving jolt right to our heart. And we would literally pass out, wake up, and say... I'm still here. Awesome news. Awesome <laughs> news. This is the protection against sudden cardiac arrest. So the three of you all made this choice. I mean, in your case, your family, so I can understand yeah. that that might happen. Um, why did you each feel this was so critical? Well, I spoke to Lisa, I spoke to my cardiologist, and they all said this thing could save your life. If you don't have it, you go in cardiac arrest, you will die. In, in, in a, a very high likely, ch uh, just a high chance you will die if I didn't have this in me. Um, I spoke to my family about it and, um, and we decided to, yeah, let's go ahead and get this thing in me. The one thing I should say is with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not everybody needs an ICD. 
about 25% of us are at high risk for sudden cardiac arrest. The rest of us are potentially needing medication. So we'll take beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Some will take antiarrhythmic drugs. Some people will need a heart surgery called a myectomy. Some people will need a heart transplant. So it really depends on the presentation of the disease in the individual. While she's my daughter, she doesn't have the exact same heart as I do. My structure of my heart is a little different. Kevin's heart is very different than ours. While we all have the same disease, how it's impacted our heart and what treatment options we choose are very, very different. And that's where HCM gets a little complicated, and that's what I spend my day doing is helping people navigate that system. And in Kevin's case, he had risk factors that put him at very high risk for cardiac arrest, and I was very happy the day he called me and said his device was in. Good news, in fact. Still not an easy decision to make. It is surgery. It's, it's, uh, it is a major surgery. There's healing that has to occur. And then I, uh, the learning curve. Um, Kevin ha has had one, one little scare thus far. Yes. Um, but it was great to know. It was almost a test, weirdly, for him to say, this device actually worked for me. You've had your similar experience as well. Because what we didn't touch on earlier is that you are an equestrian athlete. Yeah. So you get the thing stuck in there and great, I've got the insurance policy, everything's working great. <laughs> then you have a test. Yes, so <laughs> I can explain what happened. Well, when I was on a horse, I was on a runaway horse and obviously if you're on a runaway horse, your adrenaline will go up. Well, my heart went up over 220 beats per minute and luckily my ICD triggered that and I had a shock and if it was appropriate, hopefully, because it did save me, and at that point, after the first shock, I jumped off the horse, and it shocked me back, and my heart went down, and the ICD did save me, hopefully. So, I'm still here. Good to see you, yes. good to have you as well. <laughs> as a mother, I know this must have been uh, difficult to take for you. The whole thing. The whole thing. So from the time she was 10 years old, and we found out that HCM was present in her heart, and we needed to make the decision to put a device in, it wasn't our decision, even though she was only 10. She was an active participant in that decision. And she said, Mom, you have one. Her cousin has one. Her grandfather had one. She said, we just get ICDs, and they'll make me safer. And it gave her confidence, and it gave her reassurance that while she had HCM, she has to worry about HCM a little bit. She, she had the ultimate protection. So we also wanted to share, um, those of you, a slightly humorous moment. Um, before Kevin went to do his surgery, he decided to share his experience in this form. And as such, he tried to document the parts that he was able to. So as soon as he was wheeled out of surgery, he got one of his family members to record this moment for us. You can tell all my co-workers uh, that I'm... That you're loopy? Yeah. <laughs> awesome, I definitely will. I wouldn't use, use the word loopy because I'm... Hey, that's not it's okay, they'll see the video. They'll watch the video, it's okay. I, um, uh, okay. Yeah, beautiful. You're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Do they all come out like this? So, well, some more than others. <laughs> okay. It's probably because he's not used to taking anything. Oh, that's true. Yeah, he is it. So one of the reasons we thought it was a good idea, besides for the fact that we like to make fun of Kevin, was to show that really there's, um, there's an experience that goes with these things, that it is a journey, and some of it is scary and frightening. But there are also parts that are full of love and family support and humor. And, of course, we like that he mentioned his coworkers as one of the... <laughs> things that he did. So we're going to take a break really quickly. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about um, other life-saving equipment and who you can turn to in the event of emergency. Before we take that break, though, let's go back just a step, because one of the things I really forgot to ask all of you is what this feels like for you to have this piece of equipment as part of the fabric of your body. Mm -hmm. um, I have had a device in my chest since 1992. Um, I was 23 years old when I had my first device put in, so to me, I don't know what it's like to not have one anymore. It's just part of who you are, and it doesn't hurt. It's not a problem for me. Beck, what do you think? Same exact thing. I mean, I've had one when I was 10, and eight years later, I'm still here. I already had a replacement, and I'm still doing fine. Each sur surgery went perfectly fine, and I can still do everything normally. 
What about you, Kevin? Because it's fairly fresh for you. It's fairly new to me still. I'm still getting a little used to it. Um, once in a while, I could feel you know, that there's something there, but there's a lot of other times I don't even notice it. Um, I usually notice it a bit more when I'm taking off my shirt to go swimming or something. But other than that, I don't really feel it too much. So I'm not too worried or concerned that it's there. So are there any cons to this? Any reasons this isn't a good idea for some folks? Or just that? Well, you don't, you don't want to get one if you don't need one. Mm. This is a medical device. There are leads going in your heart. They aren't without complication. So there could be problems. You could have a recall of your device. You need to take that into consideration and accept that I, I accept the risk of having a man-made device put in my chest. And as long as you can accept that, we're, we're pretty good. The only downfall, I would say, is going through security because we can't go through magnets, you know, <laughs> no. the magnetic things. So we either go through the new radar thingies or we get patted down and unfortunately they don't let the cute guys hand with girls. So. <laughs> Somehow that's just how it so happens. It just doesn't work that way. So we just get patted down. Fair enough. All right, we're going to take that break that I mentioned a moment ago, talking about some other life-saving equipment and also who people can turn to in the event of an emergency. We'll be right back. This is a Cayman 27 special report, a matter of the heart. Sponsored by Cayman Airways and the Reef Resort. So before the break, we talked about ICDs, but there is something else that can help those who don't have one. It's a device, frankly, recommended for all places where large numbers of people gather. Lisa Salberg of Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is here to tell us a little more, and of course, Dr. Yin as well. So in the United States, there's a big drive to get portable defibrillators everywhere, and I was really happy to see that the Cayman Islands were also pushing to get AEDs everywhere, including schools and athletic events. So this is an AED up here and Flat Stanley is laying down here looking a little ill <laughs> at the moment, but um, we've got the demo unit here that all you would do is play the little button here. It would read the heart rhythm. If a shock is advised, this little button flashes. All you do is push the button. They have tested these devices with children as young as five years old, and they can use them safely. You can't shock somebody who doesn't need to be shocked. So if we're unable to identify somebody with HCM or any other disease that can cause sudden cardiac arrest in advance, and you see somebody down on the ground, first step, begin compression-only CPR, and we can put some links up to show you how to do that. Get the local AED or call 911 to bring it to you, and don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to take it off the wall and use the device and follow the prompts. Anybody can use it, and you can save a life. So we have um, some, uh, a bit of video to show you. There's some schools in the U.S. that have a drill that they carry out. We want to take a quick look to show people about what one of these schools are doing. Marilyn, take my cell phone, call 911, tell them we're in the back gym, rear entrance, please. All right, Herman, Michelle, go wait for EMS, okay, tell them where we are in the gym. Lauren, go get the trainer. Francesca, Amanda, go take the rest of the team. The volleyballs out of the gym to the corner with the rest of the team. Nice job, ladies. Nice drill. Bring them in, please. Well done. Dr. Hart on three. 
So we just saw in that video, Coach, using an AED, kind of an example, a, a drill almost, if you will, to sh give people a sense of what it's like to have an AED and have it actually used. Dr. Yin has been working actually around the country because AEDs were fairly new for us. That's right. Before the Cayman Heart Fund actually, you know, started this AED campaign, you know, businesses and uh, were already having AEDs in their in their place of work because they are familiar with what AEDs are. However, it wasn't really, and none of the schools had AED, none of the playing fields had them, public places didn't have them, and therefore the Cayman Heart Fund you know, found that this is a very important part of the community. We want to make Cayman cardiac safe. And AED, as, as Lisa has explained, is a very important part of the equipment that actually can bring lives back, yeah. right? And part of the program of just not just ha having an AED in your in your workplace or in a public place we want pe personnel to be trained to be CPR trained which is a you know cardiopulmonary resuscitation so with that together with an AED if anybody collapses on the ground you know what to do and hopefully we will be able to sensitize the whole community you know with this new idea that don't just stand around do something you know call 911 but do something before the ambulance arrive because every minute that passes survival rate goes down I think that's an excellent point. You really have a good four to five minutes to really get there because after that you start losing your brain and, and your brain dies, you die. <clears throat> if we think about a cardiac arrest drill, like a fire drill or a hurricane drill or whatever other kind of drills you do in your workplaces or schools, this is what's going to make people comfortable with this technology and this concept and the fact that truly anybody could save a life. It's an amazing um, power, really, when you think about it. I think some of us may be afraid that we are going to mess it up somehow, but it actually is truly quite simple. Yes, Just follow the directions. The only way to mess it up is to not do anything. Exactly. Good and point. it will not deploy. The biggest fear people have is say that, what if you do it? I mean, if a person is conscious and talking to you from just say, don't put the AED on them because they are alive, right? But you cannot find a pulse, the person is not responding, that you feel nothing. You put it on. It will sense if its heart is still beating. It will not deploy. It won't tell you to do it. And I must mention that you know since um, the Kenya Heart Fund done this AED campaign, we now have an extra 120 AEDs around the community. We also have a registry that people can register onto, and which means that when you call 911, the 911 person will tell you there is an AED 120 feet from you. Wonderful. So this is very important to the rest of the people who are listening at this particular point in time. Please, if you haven't registered your your AED in your workplace or your school, register on the website and came in hot front and it will go straight to 911 where it will be. We have a nationwide AED program. So that's going to help us. And that's every fantastic. school now should have one by the time we uh, you know, um, sort of like present schools uh, at the end of it this month. Definite progress being made. And of course, not just for HCM, but for any of the related conditions. Now, um, or unrelated, anything to do with your heart, in fact. Any cardiac arrest. A general question for me, if, if I suspect I might have a heart condition, where do I go? Is it just my doctor or? Well, the HCMA recommends you start with your primary care physician, mm -hmm. discuss your signs and symptoms with them, and they will help you find a, the appropriate specialist. If you need to have cardiac workups, we recommend having a cardiologist do them and making sure that you have the appropriate test for whatever you're concerned about. If you suspect HCM, you start with an EKG, which is an electrocardiogram. It measures the electrical impulses in your heart. Then we move to an echocardiogram, which is a sonogram of the heart, so you can actually see the structure. Now, for some people, they may need to go to additional care, looking at cardiac MRI, which is a subspecialty. I'm not sure if you have cardiac MRI here on the island. Um, if not, we can help you find something in the States. And then the, the therapies that you need really need to be very specific to your needs. It's, it's not always easy to find the right doctor for your needs, but if you look hard enough, you can find the one that's going to help you best. It's an interesting thing too, the mm -hmm. uniqueness. I mean, we forget that we are all individual humans with exactly. different bodies, different family history. Um, even being diagnosed with a similar or the same condition doesn't mean that the treatment will be identical, Yeah, does even it? being female. One last point I'd like to, mm -hmm. uh, to emphasize before we leave the program is that Lisa was saying that, you know, 50% of the athletes who die from sudden cardiac uh, syndrome is actually Afri African American. African so, area. therefore, you know, we are living in the Caribbean, so we have a higher risk of this. So, it's even more important that we actually respond to this demographic point of view and start screening in schools. I mean, I think this is one thing I can say on the Cayman Heart Fund side. We want to concentrate now to do, you know, young cardiac screening in school children. And I was interested because, uh, you know, initially I thought, this is going to be so expensive. How are we going to do it? But screening is really asking good questions. Mm -hmm. The HCMA endorses a good questionnaire as the starting point for screening. We believe wholeheartedly in screening, but screening is not a test. Screening is communication, education, and understanding. 
And if you answer our questionnaire, you can do it online, you can do it on Facebook, you can do it on paper. If you answer yes or unsure to anything, you have a conversation with your health care provider mm -hmm. and say, I have had these symptoms. Doctor, what should I do I about this? And the doctor will use their assessment to get you to the right test, and you can live a normal, healthy, happy life with a diagnosis. It's not a death sentence by any means. You can be happy, healthy, and active with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and lots of other heart diseases. But if you don't know, it's not good. Sudden death is not what you want to experience. Definitely not. Dr. Yen, you've had a lot of experience with us over the years, and that is a, it's an interesting area of focus for me it that is. all of a sudden I realized there is something concrete we could do in this instance as well. Mm -hmm. We thought it was this incredibly rare thing that happens to only a tiny few elite athletes somewhere, but it turns out that the potential is far greater far because greater. of where we are, and therefore we should focus more attention mm -hmm. on it. And then we are trying to cover the whole spectrum, screening, identification of person early. It, it goes on to, to every disease, cancer, heart you know, hypertension, diabetes, the same approach. So why not this? So we need to start with young children. Let's screen them. Let's make sure that, you know, they don't have this underlying HCM or with Parkinson's like or dysrhythmia. And, uh, and then go from there. Your primary care physician hopefully will be able to help you, you know, to identify what the next step is for the test that Kevin has done and, and Lisa has done. All right. Well, thank you both. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have some closing comments. Thank you. So before we go, some final word from words from our guests. I guess the most important question for us is to say, what's the most important thing you each want people to know to take away from the program? Lisa. Well, for me, I, I would definitely like people to know that a diagnosis of HCM is compatible with a normal life, so they shouldn't be afraid to be diagnosed, and that there are simple tools that they can use to help identify if they or their children are at risk, and we'd encourage you to visit our website at 4hcm.org to learn more about them and to really get the Caymans in, up to date with what's going on in HCM and give you the tools you need for a successful future. And we're really happy to partner with the Cayman Heart Fund to get that to happen. Dr. Yen? I must thank Kevin, seriously, you know, for bringing this to the forefront because there's so many heart disease that we, can, we, we deal with. We have been concentrating, obviously, on coronary artery disease, uh, which is the most important thing that seems to be the number one killer here in the Cayman Islands. But now, having gone through this segment myself, it suddenly brought it to my, my attention that we really need to concentrate on the young children in the school to really screen them. So I think Kevin and I are going to partner together and we'll take this to the next, next level. Fantastic. Kevin, what about you? Yeah, if anyone has any questions about what to do, feel free to contact me. I will put you in the right, uh, I'll put you in touch with the right people. Um, and also, don't be afraid to get screened. I know I don't like to go to hospitals. I don't like to do all that sort of stuff. I, I, I like to be me <laughs> and don't think I need any help on anything. Um, but don't be afraid because it could mean your life. It, I could have been dead if I did not actually step up and do what I needed to do. And I'm so, so thankful and glad that I just, that little voice in my head set to go and I did. Interestingly enough, um, it's awareness at times too that makes the difference. Um, hearing from someone like you, Kevin, who um, took the risk to find out what was wrong before it was too late. Um, those are very inspiring stories, but all too often mm -hmm. we don't talk about this until someone has passed on. Yeah. Um, so to have the opportunity to do that now and to share that, your experience with people, but also yours as well. I mean, you have a, a family history. You've made a life's work out of making sure people know about this. And so we're really thankful that you took your experience and instead of just living with it, shared it. Well, thank you. My sister Lori is who, who pushed me into my journey when she passed away at the age of 36. Mm -hmm. And there's always that one butterfly, I call it, that can flutter its wings and change the world. And I think here in the Cayman Islands, it was Jerome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So thank you for having us down here. We really like the opportunity to share our message with populations that can really benefit from it. And, and as Dr. Yun said before, it is true that 50% of those who die on the athletic field from HCM are black or African American. And we really need to make sure that that population is hearing this message and gets to screening and gets to diagnosis. We don't need to lose any more young men and it mostly is men who die in the athletic field. While women are at risk too, young men are at higher risk. So young men, please don't be afraid to get screened. And as you've uh, illustrated in this program, you can have a healthy, um, happy, productive life. Your daughter is still participating in sports. She is. Um, it the right ones. It does, yeah, you have to, I mean, of course you have to be careful. And no, that I've learned as well. But you're not going to run the marathon or going to climb Mount Everest no. or something. No. I mentioned that as well, again, in our talks with Lisa earlier on. 
I learned a lot from her today, that hydration. You see, in Cayman, we are so hot in the tropics, right? So people who have got HCM are generally much more at risk, again, of uh, sudden cardiac death because they're dehydrated. Mm. And so I could see Kevin carrying around that big mug, and I thought it was coffee, but it's not, it's water. So yeah, Kevin absolutely. is learning. So again, people who are not even don't even know they have got the condition, they collapse, and because they're dehydrated on the field, running so hard, so they're doing more things to themselves. But if you know you've got the disease process, you ain't going to let that happen to you because you're going to, to listen to it. All right, well, thank you all once again. Um, we wanted to leave you by saying that if you have any questions, you can always email Lisa at the HCMA. You can also email the Cayman Heart Fund. And our own Kevin Wattler, of course, he always puts information on the web. He'll direct you to people who can give you more information. We did want to give a special thank you to Cayman Airways for flying down some of our guests for the program and also to the Reef Resort for giving them a place to stay. And, of course, Westar, as always, for making the program possible. Thank you all for watching. And, of course, visit our website at cayman27.ky for more information. This has been a Cayman 27 special report.